Well, well. Y'all, Saturday night, y'all ought to be ready to rock. Looks like, I, looks like I'm standing in front of a bunch of bandits. Well, let me welcome you to week two of the Church Regathered and our second Saturday night service. Uh, just for your information, last week we had right at 75 here. We've got 74, 75 here again tonight, so that's pretty consistent. Uh, last Sunday morning in the morning service, we had close to 120 in the morning service. We had over 30 on Facebook Live while we were doing the morning service. So uh, three of those three options are going to be uh, the options for the foreseeable future, uh, at least through June. I'm thinking probably until August. Uh, and again, remember, there's, there's no Sunday school, no children's church, uh, no nursery. Uh, by all means, encourage families to come. We're doing worship both Saturday night and Sunday morning old school. Uh, that is, the little ones can sit with mom and dad. I kind of think we ought to get back to that um, and, and do that more often. Uh, teach from the very earliest of age possible children how to worship together as the family of God. Uh, so that's, that's how we're doing it. Uh, let me remind you also, this coming Wednesday night, uh, the 27th, we're going to re-kick and restart our Wednesday night adult Bible study. So if you want to come Wednesday night and join me, uh, 6.30, we'll be in the Gospel of Luke, uh, just like we were when we left off way back in March. It's been uh, more than two months now. Let me, as we begin tonight, uh, let me encourage you to find Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, let me repeat something I said last week. Uh, if you were here, uh, so whether it was Sunday morning or Saturday night, Maybe you'll remember this. And by the way, we are not handing out notes, but I'm sending notes to, to Jean Murchison early, and she's posting them on Facebook, uh, on, our, on our webpage. You can pull up, you can look at your notes on your phone, uh, on your tablet uh, beforehand, or bring it with you, and you can see them there on your tablet. One of the guidelines is uh, we've been encouraged not to hand things out, no bulletins, uh, hand out things of that nature. Uh, so we're honoring and respecting that, uh, but we are still making notes available. They are ready. They are available. You'll just have to see them online on our uh, Facebook page. This is what I said last week. I said one of the sustaining gifts God has given to us to not only survive in difficult times, whether we're talking about a pandemic or whether we're talking about difficult days in our life otherwise, not only to survive but to thrive as disciples of Christ is the community of faith, that is, the church. Uh, the church is a gift that we are a part of that is designed to, to be there to, to help us. Or to put it another way, let me just say it this way, church matters. It really, really matters. I appreciate, appreciate something our governor, uh, Bill Lee, said very early on in all of this. And then uh, yesterday, President Trump acknowledged this very same thing when he said that churches are essential. And Governor Lee said that two months ago and put basically no restrictions on churches per se as churches. Uh, he recognized that, and I appreciate leaders who recognize the importance of the church and the church being able to meet together, to worship together. It is uh, crucial and essential for the health of people that churches be able uh, to meet together. Now, I absolutely agree with that, but you know what? I don't think many Christians uh, agree with it. You, you want me to tell you why I think that? Is because long before this pandemic hit, far too many Christians were seeing the church as a take it or leave it, I'll be there when I want to. We, were, we have a lot of people treating it as non-essential even before any of this happened. One of the things I've hoped and prayed throughout all of this is that believers would begin to see just how important it is to be able to worship together. When, when it's taken away from you, maybe that's what it takes to help us understand how important it really is that we be able to worship together with the body of Christ uh, it's, it's got to be a priority in your life as a believer. One of the fears a lot of pastors are having these days is that when all of this is over, that a lot of people are, are not going to be coming back to worship. How do I know that? Aaron Earls, who is an, the online editor for Facts and Trends, just this week 
put the results of an interview he did, interviews with a, at least a dozen pastors, and he wrote a little post entitled Nine Concerns Pastors Have About Their Church Gathering Again. Uh, and some of these are, are real pragmatic, uh, but let me just give you the last three of the concerns expressed by pastors all across uh, the convention, Southern Baptist Convention, that he interviewed. The last three of those concerns were growing too comfortable with online services, losing the habit of church attendance, and the third one, drifting away from the church's priority. Now, if I may be so bold as we begin and prepare to look at Hebrews chapter 10, we already had this before the pandemic. We already had this very same thing before the pandemic. Even the language, essential and non-essential, is somewhat problematic. I've been reading this week a young writer and pastor out in California by the name of Brett McCracken. He has, he's written three outstanding books and blogs quite a bit. The three books that he's written are entitled Hipster Christianity, Gray Matters. Gray Matters deals with legalism and, and, and uh, uh, liberty in Christ. And then the book he's just written, the one I've been reading this week, is entitled Uncomfortable. Uh, he wrote a little piece this week entitled, Why Don't We See Church as Essential? Listen to what he wrote in this article. He said, and he lives out in California, he said, When I saw my governor's announcement that church gatherings won't resume until stage three of California's reopening plan, I was sad. Not because I disputed the high risk such gathering pose, but because it underscores how low priority church going has become in contemporary Western culture. In California, churches are in the same reopening category as nail salons, gyms, and movie theaters. Nice to have luxuries we can presumably live without for a prolonged season. Churches are lumped in with entertainment options. Good for people who like that sort of thing, but by no means essential for human and societal flourishing, and certainly not worth the potential health risk. It's telling that our society has decided we cannot live without essentials, like liquor stores, marijuana dispensaries, and golf courses, but we can live without physical church gatherings. Do we realize how revolutionary this is in the scheme of history? Mere decades ago, the role of church-going in society was so central in day-to-day -day life, so fundamental to the well-being of both individuals and communities, that it would be unthinkable to relegate church gatherings to non-essential status. That we have come to see embodied church gatherings as non-essential speaks to a few dynamics that the COVID-19 pandemic did not create, but has exposed. These dynamics were not imposed by some external anti-Christian boogeyman. In many cases, they are dynamics perpetuated by Christians themselves. You really ought to read that and, and think about it. I mean, he nails it. Our problem today is that far too many who are part of the church don't see the church as essential. You know, that's not new. You know how I know that's not new? Hebrews chapter 10 addresses the very same thing. In Hebrews chapter 10, I want you to look with me at this passage. And, and this is the continuation of last week. If you recall, I said last week what I wanted to do as we looked at the church regathered is I wanted to look at us with two passages set beside one another to compare and contrast an Old Testament passage and a New Testament passage. In the Old Testament passage, we looked at uh, Psalm 122, and we looked at it under the banner of the church regathered in Old Testament encouragement. The thing that I highlighted or wanted you to note then, and I want you to note now, is the difference in context of Psalm 122 and the church regathering, the Old Testament church, so to speak, and Hebrews chapter 10 in the context in which there is an appeal to gather. The context is is very important for us because these contexts apply to us today. In Psalm 122, the context is the community of faith and an involuntary exile. Psalm 122, one of the ascent psalms, has a background of one of two things. 
Some see it as being used, these psalms being used as songs as the people of Israel were returning from exile in Babylon. An involuntary exile. They weren't in Babylon because they said, hey, let's all go to Babylon for a while. God moved in judgment and they were exiled from home for 70 years. Involuntarily. Or if we see that Psalm 122 in the context of using these psalms for the yearly feast, going up to Jerusalem to worship together, uh, a context that again points to an involuntary exile because there we have the people of God recognizing this world is not their home. And by going to Jerusalem to worship at the Peace of Pentecost or, or Passover or the Feast of Booths, they were acknowledging and coming together that indeed this world was not their home. And they were coming together to worship with the people of God. Again, an involuntary exile. That's not the case as we come to Hebrews chapter 10. As we come to Hebrews chapter 10, we see a different picture altogether. We see not an involuntary exile, but a self-imposed exile. Look at the text with me, if you would. Beginning in verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises is faithful." And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, most of the time when we look at this passage, we are looking at it in this type of context. You talk to someone, or you, you come across someone, or you, you pass one another, or people in Kroger or Walmart or at the ball fields, and you know that you go to church together, but you haven't seen them in a long time. And you engage them, and you begin to listen to what they have to say, and for whatever reason, they're not coming to church. And it seems to you, as you engage them in conversation, they are not glad when it is said, let us come to the house of the Lord and worship. Whatever reason or excuse they have, there just doesn't seem to be any anticipation of joy of being able to come together and worship. They've relegated gathering as the people of God, going to church, as a non-essential activity. It's just not something important in their life right now. As, as Brett McCracken said, they've come to see the embodied church gatherings as non-essential, a reality perpetrated by the Christians themselves. That is, it's just not important. Does the Bible have anything to say about the idea that, you know what, yeah, I'm a believer, but you know what, I can worship God on my own terms, in my own way. I do not need to go to church to worship and be a good Christian. Does the Bible say anything about that? Well, as a matter of fact, it does. Right here in this passage in Hebrews chapter 10. In this passage, we have the writer to the Hebrew Christians actually issuing a command to believers, exhorting them, listen, do not neglect assembling together. Do not relegate worship with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ as a non-essential activity in your life. It is essential. It's essential not only for you, but it's essential for those who are part of the body. And that's where we tend not to think very much. We, we tend to think it's all about us, but it's not. Again, how many times have you heard me say, you were not saved in a vacuum? There's a context to salvation. And that context is the body of Christ, believers. Again, I am hoping believers are learning in light of the last couple of months that the availability of and the ability to gather together really does matter. Being an active and engaged part of a local church really, really, really matters. Matters more than you realize that it matters. One of my favorite quotes from Charles Haddon Spurgeon deals with gathering as a church. 
Listen to what he said. He said, if I had never joined a church till I found one that was perfect, I would never have joined one at all. And the moment I did join, if I had found one, I would have spoiled it, for it would not have been a perfect church after I became a member of it. Still, imperfect as it is, it is the dearest place on earth to us. Yeah, no, we're not perfect, far from it. And if we are perfect, you join, that takes us down a notch. But you know what? It is still the sweetest thing in the life of a follower of Jesus. The world needs to see that. It needs to know that. In his book, Uncomfortable, Brett McCracken said this of the consumer mentality of the church in our day. He said, the Western world doesn't need a more muddled, confused, I love Jesus but not the church Christianity made up of a million different opinions and to each his own permutations. Rather, it needs a true, unified, eloquent witness to the distinctly alternative vision for the life that Jesus offers. And this will only come with a renewed commitment to the local church in all of its uncomfortable but life-giving community. Now, I love what Spurgeon said. I love what McCracken said. They're basically saying the same thing. It's time to be the church. If the church is going to be what it's, in t- it's designed by God to be in the community that we are planted, then Christians are going to have to be willing to do the hard things, to embrace the hard truths, and to do life with hard people for the sake and glory of the one who did the hardest thing. Hebrews chapter 10. In this passage, I want you to look at this exhortation, this command, if you would, to these believers from the writer of the letter. We don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. The more I read it, the more I see it, the more I can see the handprint of Paul on it. But I still don't believe Paul wrote it. I do believe someone very close to Paul who was influenced by Paul did. In this passage in Hebrews chapter 10, we we have the writer addressing a group of people under what I'm calling a self-imposed exile. This is not an exile that's involuntary where they've been scattered. This is not an exile where the government has said you cannot meet. This is not an exile where a pandemic has mandated or at least strongly suggested it's in your best health interest not to gather with other people. This is a case where a group of people have just neglected to come together. They have imposed this upon themselves. It's due in part to a rising persecution from some very malevolent forces in the community, but it doesn't mandate that they not attend. If you read Hebrews very carefully, you'll find the pressures mounting on the group of believers here in this congregation, uh, and the pressures mounting because of one thing. They're commitment to follow Christ. It was beginning to cost them to follow Christ. And as a result of that, in part, they had chosen not to meet. The response of some, not all, but of some, is very similar to what many have done today when trouble mounts in their life. They have exiled themselves from the community of faith. They've cut themselves off from the support of believers. They are essentially answering with their actions the question, is Jesus really worth this? Is Jesus really worth the trouble that it takes to get together and go worship with people? Is Jesus really worth it? Is he worth it to the body of Christ to meet with the body of Christ? Or how about this? Is it really worth the community having a witness in that community of the power of Christ to change a life? Is it really worth gathering to have that kind of a witness to a community? Oh, trust me, the community notices when a church is not there, just as they notice when the church is there. See, a lot of our communities, particularly here in the South, have taken for granted what a lot of believers take for granted. Ah, the church will always be there when I need it. Really? Really? Uh, What's happened the last couple of months? In this passage in Hebrews chapter 10, 
we find out just how much Jesus is worth it. In these verses, verse 19 through verse 25, we have what is called a turning point passage in the book of Hebrews. That's something Paul does very regularly, by the way, in his letters, a, a turning point where he has been talking of some theological issue, and about halfway through his letter, the turning point comes, and he shifts from the theological issue to the practical application of it. He talks about some profound theological thing, and then he shows his recipients why that matters. How does this truth apply in your life? How does this doctrine apply to your life? In the first 18 verses of this 10th chapter of Hebrews, the writer culminates the argument of the book. And the argument of the book has been this. Jesus is better. He's a better mediator. He's a better priest. He's a better sacrifice. He's established a better covenant. He is better than angels. He's better than Moses. That's the argument of the book of Hebrews. And as we come to the 19th verse, he takes that argument, he summarizes it, he crystallizes it, and then he applies it to the heart of believers. And here's what we get when we do that. Two things I want us to look at tonight. The first one is he shows us our reason for being. Or to put it another way, the person and work of Jesus Christ is why we are here. Notice, if you would, verses 19, 20, and 21. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh... And since we have a great priest over the house of God. Now, in those three verses, the writer gives us the basis of Christianity. He gives us the very foundation of what it means to be the church or how we can possibly be the church. In these verses, he gives us the reason for the forgiveness of sin. In these verses, he gives us the reason that we have a hope of eternal life. In these verses, he gives us our very reason for being. And it's summed up in the repetition of a three-word phrase. That phrase is, since we have. There are two things the writer says that we have. And since we have these, there's an implication that goes with it. Notice the two things. You see them in verse 20, uh, verse 19 and verse 21. In verse 19, since we have confidence to enter the holy place. That's a reference to the Old Testament holy of holies. Paul, if you understand how that worked in the Old Testament, one time a year, the Day of Atonement, the high priest took the sacrifice of the perfect lamb. He carried that blood into the holy of holies, into the holy place, once a year. Only the high priest had access to that holy place. The writer is saying in this passage, that's the way it was, that's not the way it is now. Because of Jesus, we have access to that holy place. We have access into the presence of a holy God. We have that in Christ Jesus. The second sense we have in verse 21, is since we have a great high priest over the house of God. We have not only access to the very presence of the thrice holy God, but we actually have a high priest, someone to bring us into the presence of God. And that someone is Jesus. Our ability to access God is tied directly to and bound up in the person and work of Jesus. That is how we are capable of having a personal relationship with the one who created us. Because of Jesus, because of who he is, because of what he's done by his blood, by the cross, by his atoning work on our behalf, by his life, by his death, by his resurrection. With Jesus, God has offered up every sacrifice that will ever be necessary for you to enjoy communion and fellowship with him. You have access, you have a high priest, you need fear nothing or no one ever. Nothing can separate you from that access. Now, if you understand this, it should completely change your life. I mean completely change you. 
Doesn't mean there are no implications, though. It means there most certainly is something that's tied with this for us. If we've experienced this and we understand this, if we understand our reason for being, if we understand the person and work of Jesus Christ, there's much more to this than just giving a mental nod and saying, yes, I believe that. That's where we have missed it. We have convinced, we, we, we think if we're convincing people that we can, that if they understand who the facts are concerning Jesus and they can just assent to that one, then they're good. All they have to do is just verbally repeat what you say and then they can go and do whatever they want. That's the problem. That's the problem. There is an implication to this. Our reason for being has a reasonable expectation. And the writer gives us that. Three charges for the believer in light of the person and work of Christ. And one of them is going to highlight the importance of the body assembled worshiping together. You see, one of the implications of what Jesus has done and who he is is that you become part of something greater than you even begin to imagine. Now, look with these, if, we, if you would, three commands. And yes, they are. They're commands. They're exhortations to follow. The first one we find in, in verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with a heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And I'm not going to get into a lot of the details. I just want to hit the highlights of this. I'm, I'm trying to to keep this thing under control. This is really, to me, this is a three-part sermon, one on each of these. So I'm just going to hit the highlight of this, the, the practical implication of understanding who Jesus is and what he's done for you. The first one in this 22nd verse is what I want to call draw near. We are commanded to draw near. Why? Because that's what faith does. It draws near. Draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts gathered together as the body. Draw near. That's what faith does. Now listen, you don't realize how radical this is until you really understand what it took to approach God in the Old Testament. You, you don't understand how radical this one verse is, how radical this whole concept is. If you're a Jewish individual and you have heard of Jesus, Messiah, and you have cast your lot with Jesus. That is, you, you believe he's Messiah, and you are following him. But things begin to get a little tough. It's beginning to cost you a little to follow Jesus. People are talking about you, persecuting you even a little. You've even heard rumors that, you know what, they may be mistreating Christians down over here. You're beginning to think, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I want to do that after all. With that Jewish background, you've always had this conflict about can you approach God? You know the Old Testament teaching. You know the Mosaic Law. You can't approach God. You have to have a mediator, an intercessor to go for you. That's what the high priest did on the Day of Atonement. Well, here you can do it. You don't have to have another man do it for you. Jesus has made it possible for you to do so. If that's the case, then draw near. Faith does that. That's what it does. Because of the finished work of Christ, God wants you to draw near to Him in full assurance. That is absolutely mind-blowing. Draw near. You get to do what no one in Israel ever got to do. You get to draw near into the very presence of God. The question is, do you have the faith to do this? Do you have the faith to draw near together as part of the new covenant community? Notice his pronoun usage here. Let us. It's not a you thing, it's an us thing. Do you have the faith to make the commitment to draw near with the body of Christ as the body of Christ to exalt his name together? It's an integral part of what it means to be a believer. The second one is in verse 23. Not only draw near, but hold fast. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. 
Again, because of Jesus, there are certain promises that have been made that you can absolutely take to the bank. Hold fast to the promises. That's what hope does. Faith draws near. Hope holds on tight. The idea is to hold on, not you hold on to you, hold on to the promises that God has made. Do you believe what God's Word has revealed to you about who you are, who He is, what you've done, what He's done, and what you need? If you do, draw near, that's what faith does. Hold fast, that's what hope does. He is faithful. Are you? Are we? What you need is what quite oftentimes we cut ourselves off from. What believers need today, like never before, we quite frequently cut ourselves off from. And that is the lifeline of the body of Christ. I'll be honest with you. It's not an easy thing sometimes to hold on tight, to hold on fast. Man, your world gets shook up and rocked, and it seems like all you can do is hold on for dear life. That's why the body is here. Don't cut yourself off from the greatest support that you have apart from God himself and the Holy Spirit. That's how important coming together really is. And yet, far too many believers, far too many professing Christians see all of this as non-essential. Guys, listen, faith draws near. Hope holds on. The third one is found in verses 24 and 25. Here's the third lettuce. Let us consider how to stir up one another in love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Again, let me, let me ask you this question. How many, how many times have you heard me say, you're not saved in a vacuum? Through the years, it's one of those things that, that I've emphasized. is because far too long, too many have sold faith in Christ as a transaction on an individual level that has no connection to a larger purpose. That is, you just say this prayer and you go do your own thing, you don't have any responsibility to anybody else. That couldn't be more false. Here's the proof of that. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Listen to what he says. Let us consider... That sounds like a philosopher. Come, let us consider. Let me put it down on our level. I want you to think, and I want you to think really hard about this. I think my dad said that to me one or two times, looking me in the eye, going, I want you to think very hard about this. Let us think, consider, how to stop. Stir up one another. Oh, wow, that's no problem. I know how to stir people up. I got that. No, no, read the whole thing and keep it together. I want you to think seriously about how to stir one another up, stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. How do you do this? How do you consider one another? How do you think about others? How do you provoke and stir up and encourage others? How do you do that? Well, one of the ways you do that, an integral part of doing that is coming together to worship together as one. Being committed to the body. We do it because of what Jesus has done. And because of what Jesus has done for us, we are to think about others in the body, how to provoke them, 
how to encourage them, how to stimulate them, how to spur them, not to irritation, not to frustration, but to love and good need, deeds. We do it because that's what love does. Faith draws near, hope holds on, and love stirs up. And it's all done in the context of an essential gathering together. You cannot do this apart from the body. You cannot neglect meeting together, as the habit of some is, and accomplish what's laid before us in this text. You have to commit to being an active, involved part. Listen, 35 years down the road of doing this, I've had more than one conversation with more than one person that goes something like this. Well, Pastor, you know, I don't need to go to church to worship God. Well, you know, I don't, I don't have to be at church every week. I can, I can do this on my own. I, I, through, I, here's some of the things I've heard through the years. You know what? I, I feel closer to God sitting in my backyard all by myself. It's interesting. I feel closer when I hear the voices of his people singing his praises. A willful self-exile is not a part of being the body of Christ. You haven't been called to worship in exile alone. And if you think you can do it better alone, if I could sing, I would sing one of my favorite songs from the 70s from perhaps my favorite band from the 70s. Sticks. Tommy Shaw. You're fooling yourself. Anybody know that song? Love the song Fooling Yourself. You're fooling yourself if you really believe you're closer to God apart from the body. You're absolutely fooling yourself. We're committed as believers to gathering with the saints because we need it. And if you think you don't need it, I'll tell you what, I need it. You say, well, you know, I just don't get anything. What are you putting into it? Do you realize that there are people that you have an incredible impact on just by your presence? One of the people you have an influence on by your very presence alone is me. It tells me you're committed to what's going on here. If you're never here, you're telling me you don't really care about anybody here. Say, Pastor, you're being kind of forward. If you stand still, I'll be forward, backward, sideways, and upside down. We need to hear hard truth. Because we have hard heads. I need it. You need it. The body needs it. One of the most encouraging things you can do for another brother is to be here. I've heard people, oh, you know, well, I don't, you know, I don't contribute anything. Your presence contributes something. It's like your body get up in, getting up in the morning and your knees saying, I'm going to stay in the bed. You don't need me. I don't really contribute anything. Yeah, you see how far you get to the bathroom with that. <laughs> you ain't going to make it. There's a reason why the New Testament has this analogy of the human body as the body of Christ. Yeah, we're all different. Not all of us is a mouth speaking. Some of us are little pinky toes, you know. Don't nobody want to see that, Right? You ever seen some people's ugly feet? <laughs> hey, let's, let's, let's just be honest. There's some parts of the body we want to keep covered up. We don't want to see that. But I tell you what, right circumstances, that little part that you don't want to see and others don't want to see will let you know it's there. See, that may be you encouraging the body. That's why it's important to be here. That's why this writer challenges and exhorts these believers, these professing believers, listen, do not neglect coming together. You need it. They need it. But you know what? There's somebody else who needs it that we never think about. I've already hinted at it. 
the community in which you are the body needs it. It needs to see the body gathered. I'm telling you now, Munford needs the witness of Munford Baptist Church. What kind of witness is the church when half the people are never here? What kind, what are you, what's the community going to see from that? Trust me, they believe and care more than you realize. It's important that we understand, particularly in light of where we've been the last couple of months, just how critical and precious and wonderful it is to gather as the body. So much so that in a little bit different time and a different place with a different context, God saw to it that in His Word, this very issue was addressed. In light of what Jesus has done for you, in light of who He is and what He's done to make possible your access into the presence of a holy God, in light of the fact that He is your great high priest who carries you into the presence of the, this holy God who created us, because that's the case, let us do what faith does and let's come together. Let us do what hope does and hold on tight. Let us do what love does and stir one another up a little bit. I'm telling you, this world needs that. Again, I hate to quote our president in a sermon, but he made one little statement yesterday that I want to recall. He, he got it right. Our country needs more prayer, not less. God's people need to meet together. Let me close out with this from, from Brett McCracken. He said, I also hope this season shows us that privatized consumeristic spirituality is not enough. Not for individuals and not for society. We need more than just Jesus and me. More than just a Jesus and me faith that has little bearing on the world and gives us little incentive to leave the house. We need faith that is rooted in strong, serving, multiplying local church communities. The sort of faith that makes such a difference in its tangible presence that everyone notices and laments its absence. Do not neglect the assembly of the saints, you need it. We need it. They need it. We're the church regathered. Let's press on. Father, thank you this evening for allowing us to once again regather. Lord, I pray that we would hear the heart of the writer of this epistle. Yes, his context is significantly different from ours, but the principles are the same. In a culture at a time where we have not been able to meet, we now are on the cusp of a time when we might continue what some began long ago, and that is a self-imposed exile from the community of faith. As we saw last week, sometimes we can't be here. The circumstances and situation of life is of such a nature that through no fault of our own, an exile is imposed upon us. But our heart says, Lord, I'm glad when I hear those words, let us come together to worship. And I can't wait to do that. But tonight, the context is a little different. Self-imposed. Staying away, not seeing the essential nature of the body gathered. This message is brief, to the point people of God need each other. We need each other. 
If we profess Christ, we need the lifeline of the body of Christ. We need the strength that comes from the oneness of the body. We need the encouragement. We need the help. We need the reminder. We need the accountability. Lord, let us not forsake assembling together. Let us do what faith does and draw near. Let us do what hope does and hold tight. Let us do what love does. And let's exhort and encourage one another for the glory of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.